It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague who started here at the same time as I did and, and has now had a sabbatical and I know he's done some brilliant work during that sabbatical he's going to share with you. His, his research is really, one of the things that I find about Ian that's so amazing is just the diversity of his research interests and the work that he does. Uh, so while recently, just his recent accomplishments include that he was the guest editor for an issue of Journal of Education. General Education. General Education, sorry. Uh, and he did a special issue on the future of liberal arts education. He is uh, contracted to write the entry on stand-up comedy for the Encyclopedia of Humor Studies. And he's also the new editor, because this is apparently what we do in our departments. We all become journal editors, so <laughs> if you want to be a journal editor, apparently just join our department. So he's become the new um, editor of Contemporary Legend, which is the journal of the International Society for Contem Contemporary Legend. <laughs> and that's just the beginning. So I'll let him explain to you what he was doing while he was on sabbatical, but thank you very much for coming and uh, for being here to hear what Ian is going to present on today. Ian. Thank you, Heather. Um, first, can we play with the lights a little bit and get the screen a, a hint darker if that's possible? I'll send a minion for that. Minions are good. Apparently the research office has been sort of um, bombasted, if that is a word which I'm saying it is, um, with questions about what my presentation is actually about given my title. And um, I always thought it was one of those titles. Remember when Homer starts the barbershop quartet and they think they need a, a, a title that's sort of vaguely amusing at first and then just gets trite and tired the more you think about it. And I think this works well in that. I did want to um, rewrite it a little bit. I need to expand the title. So um, <laughs> other things I did on the sabbatical. Um, I've never, I think I've only ever been to one sabbatical presentation before because I am a bad colleague. So I'm not 100% sure exactly what is expected of these things, so I'll, I will wing it. I imagine that one of the things that we're thinking about is how sabbatical is sort of a, a point of reflection, a point of uh, hopefully a point of a little bit of rest and really a point of orientation and reorientation within one's teaching and service and primarily one's research career. And so um, the presentation is going to follow that as the narrative, how I'm sort of finishing up a couple of projects and instigating new ones and trying to part, uh, set a new course that isn't wholly removed from what I've been doing but is it's much more in keeping with my actual interests and so forth. First thing I need to do is uh, sort of go over the actual uh, um, uh, rationale for the sabbatical. So I talk about my shirk funded research, and the, the two major projects I was going to do was was um, uh, this work on the trestle and this work on um, uh, turning my dissertation into a manuscript. So I'll talk about that, and then I'll talk about other projects that are in different stages of initiation. And I think I cover most of the things that I did this year. So the first one is the painting of the Sydney River Trestle. I've spoken about this a couple of times to various people in this room, um, so I think many of you are aware of it. For those who aren't, just the background information, this builds on first an RP grant from 2010, for which I am grateful, and um, a Shirk grant for 2011, for which I am also grateful. I was able to hire two students, one uh, Kira Larson in the summer 2010, and one Jess McDonald in the summer 2011. I was able to conduct or have my students conduct research at the Beaton, McConnell Library, Riverview. I was able to go to Halifax to con uh, consult at NSARM and I was able to make a trip to Ottawa uh, to go to the Library and Archives Canada. Um, so it was reasonably successful, all things considered. I was able to locate and interview the very first painter and uh, hopefully and did begin to establish many networks with former paint crews and that has helped me develop a photographic record. I see one of those former painters here today, and I won't point them out, but we all know who it is. Um, that being said, this was a strange year to do this particular form of research because of the zero tolerance policy that became instituted. As you know, in 2009, there was more or less that official crackdown and the, the promise by the student unions that they wouldn't do it again. And uh, both the winter of two th uh, the fall winter 2009 and the fall uh, to 2010 and the fall winter 2010 to 2011 saw fallow periods of bridge painting which are as much ascribable to bad weather than they were necessarily to a strict obedience to this because you did see once spring arrived uh, a flurry of bridge painting activity again but in uh, October October 27th of last year 
um, almost exactly a year ago that the uh, rail company did finally uh, officially paint it, at which point this uh, zero tolerance policy was introduced. So you have seen in the past couple of weeks some additional paintings starting in, in late August and going on. Um, then there was that uh, Riverview Bridge, well, around September 10th or so, maybe it was the week before, and the, um, uh, the immediately followed by a Sydney Academy painting over it. You haven't seen much activity since, but as opposed to other forms of networking, these are now even sort of further sub rosa. So it's very, it has been very difficult to establish contact with contemporary painters, which is, of course, an issue. But one of the things that I, I'm sort of the thoughts, processes that I'm developing about this have to do with the bridge itself. And I think, first and foremost, you can come into this idea as, you know, as an ethnographer, as a folklorist, as an anthropologist, however you want to say, and impose a particular uh, a theoretical framework on this, that this is a representative of some form of boundary, liminal space, yada yada, all this sort of aspect of imbuing this bridge with a certain amount of uh, symbolic gravitas. Um, but you do want to test that theory, um, and one of the things that's happened is certainly both through interview and through uh, discourses that you see through <coughs> vernacular sources like yearbook write-ups and, and, and other forms of interview, is that you do get the sense that there is this sense of a boundary. There is this sense of, of some kind of division in the landscape. So the theoretical aspect is borne out in the vernacular theory about the bridge. Um, I've been spending a lot of time this year thinking about traffic patterns and the history of traffic in Sydney, which has turned me into a scintillating conversationalist. <laughs> <coughs> um, but I think one of the things is that this is a mundane piece of architecture, and it's a very unattractive piece of architecture in its own right. But for the better part of 30 or 40 years, a significant amount of traffic was funneled through it until, and uh, really up until the, you know, after my arrival here, up until the, the late uh, 2007 or 2008 when that final, uh, that exit to Cox Heath was finally constructed. Basically, in order to get to Riverview, you were funneled through that truss, uh, underneath that trestle irrespective of the highway. And, that, and so the things that we pass every day do become imbued with meaning despite the fact that they might not necessarily be understood as particularly uh, fancy or normal. I think this is important to, to bear in mind when we, because people are often ask me to compare this to the trestle that gets painted in Memorial that has happened with uh, at Memorial High School up in North Sydney. And um, that is, it just seems to be uh, less of a, a point of contention within the contemporary debate, in large part because it doesn't have that level of centrality and it doesn't have that level of a uh, landmark that the other that that uh, the Sydney River Trestle has. Um, and I think also when you're thinking about traffic patterns, it has to do with the development of of Sydney and the Greater Sydney area as a city, as a the beginnings and you could argue the ends of a metropolis of sorts. Uh, one of the things that the trestle did was it was sort of step one in trying to rationalize uh, uh, railway versus traffic patterns. And again, if you want to really delve into the history of traffic <coughs> in Sydney, uh, rail was a, con was a serious consideration. I'm sure people here can remember uh, you know, Charlotte, uh, you know, Prince Street being shut for uh, cumulatively hours every day as trains passed. The trestle was there to reconcile a particular uh, rail crossing over the Sydney River, obviously and the reconfiguration of, uh, of uh, the road to Cox Heath and replacing a single lane bridge with a double lane bridge. But grand master plans of rationalizing traffic in Sydney never really needed to transpire because it coincided with the decline of industry and, and the, the fewer and fewer trains that were on the rail. Until today, you only see what the train is once a week one way, once a week the other, and it's a, it's a modicum of cars as opposed to the mile-long car loads that are now part of the collective narrative of, of Sydney. <clears throat> so again, this boundary, because it's, in, it's, it's caught up in the history of, of the city as it develops, is um, it's literally, well, it's, it, it, it's sort of a boundary in the same way that social puberty marks a boundary irrespective of the actual uh, sexual development. Uh, this it marks a boundary between Riverview and the other schools, irrespective of the actual history of the catchment area. I don't think we need to dwell on that too much. But it also has um, 
different senses of overlapping and, and sometimes contradictory boundary issues as well. Issues of class, issues of city versus suburb, or suburb versus exurb, or rural versus, uh, rural versus cosmopolitan, and all the various connotations that that might imply. And, um, but finally, I think we need to think about the trestle. It was first painted in 1981 in the uh, light of the sort of beginnings of adolescent existentialism that existed, that I think has its, well, I mean, not that adolescents are ever anything but annoying, but, um, but that really had, in the particular Cape Breton context, with a, a reflective understanding of the, of the consequences of post-industrialism and the, and the idea of whatever future there is, it's likely that my future will not be here. And so I think it, there is a sort of certain trifecta of events that you can locate the trestle uh, alongside or uh, amongst. So you have that, you have the Grand March, you have Grading Day. These are all conspicuously industrial Cape Breton traditions that as an outsider you think, what is the big deal with this? But then you recognize that these are ceremonies to which great importance is placed in part because of uh, a tenuous and an uncertain <coughs> future. So, uh, the, and the, 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 the trestle as sort of a, a medium becomes uh, has been enrolled. Um, I've been sort of dabbling with what's it called actor network theory and trying to stretch my mind around it. But the idea of it's enrolled as an agent or as a player within the larger communicative matrix of the adolescent community in Cape Breton. So I presented on this a number of times this year. This is the checklist of accomplishments, I guess. <laughs> Starting in Bloomington uh, last year, I did a, a presentation similar to the one that I'm going to excerpt from in a few minutes. Uh, in the diamond format, which is based on the uh, Pecha Kucha uh, format delivery of a rigidly timed um, a series of slides that was able to be transferred to a, um, a YouTube video that has had been quite successful. I think it's hitting around 1,500 hits, which is no Justin Bieber, but it's, <laughs> it, it's something. And so it's attracted a fair amount of attention and, and interest to the project. Uh, I, yeah, St. Thomas, I did the Fresh Showcase this year. I was invited to speak at University of Laval. I did uh, at the Learn Is this year for FSAC and Perspectives of Contemporary Legend. And I just got back from New Orleans a week and a half ago. And so I just wanted to give this presentation. As I said, it's a, it's a, it's a well, first of all, it's an abridgment of that presentation to begin with. But it sort of talks about my current thinking on this. In particular reference, this was a panel that had to do with digital folklore and the integration of digital communications into vernacular practices. So that's why it, it dwells a little bit more on things like Facebook than you might necessarily um, imagine. So, um, and it, it is image heavy. Um, I like it for, as a format, but it's a little bit peculiar. So as we all know, the trestle, uh, the Sydney River trestle crosses the road that leads to the Sydney River Bridge which is the first fixed link joining the east and west sides of the Sydney River. The road, the trestle, and the bridge were all built in 57 and 58 to replace the old single lane bridge. Now the bridge could handle two-way automobile traffic and the rails would not cross the road leading up to it at grade. The late 1950s was a time of intense urban and suburban infrastructure building in Nova Scotia when the post-war booms, both economic and baby, manifested themselves in the final great push from country to city while the middle class blossomed and moved from city to suburb. Suburbia required the reconfiguration of exurban space. This reconfiguration included the Nova Scotia Rural High School Act of 1945, which addressed the needs of students outside of the incorporated cities and towns. One of these schools was Riverview Rural High School, located across the Sydney River in the community of Cox Heath. Again, remember I'm speaking to a, a non-local audience. Because of traffic patterns, for most of their overlapping existence, students had to walk or drive under the trestle to get to Riverview. This daily passage has rendered the trestle a landmark and a boundary between the urban and the rural, or the city and the suburb, and between Riverview and Sydney Academy, Riverview's downtown rival. And prior to the creation of regional school boards, the school from which Riverview students had been excluded. To cross this threshold was and is to enter Redmond country. Bridge painting has been more or less the exclusive domain of the senior class of Riverview since 1981, when the graduating Tom Davis slipped out of his prom, ran across the Sydney River Bridge, and sprayed Class of 81 in the 10 squares of the steel expanse in luminous orange spray paint, stolen by his father from the steel plant. Uh, <laughs> uh, keep it in the family. By rendering it anonymous, he effectively ceded ownership of the performance to the collective. As years pass, 
Each graduating class reclaimed this space, contested on occasion by their rivals at Sydney Academy and, albeit less so, all the local high schools. Painting has gone through a range of tolerances by the community. As painting became more elaborate, the tenor of the conversation shifted from defacement to expression. It was a sanctioned school activity for a stretch of years at the turn of the millennium. Since 2009, there's been an official end to the practice framed as an issue of safety and liability. It was a policy only fitfully enforced until October 2011, when the railway's present owner, Jacksonville, Florida-based Rail America, painted the trestle in metallic tram-clad paint. Rumors spread that it was a special graffiti-proof concoction. Within days, one could see flicks of red, uh, flicks of red latex testing this hypothesis. <laughs> the sense of proprietorship evidenced through the use of the first-person plural in such expressions as, it's our time to shine, and we rocked it, extended beyond school, line, extended beyond school lines to all the adolescents in the region enrolling this bridge into this larger folk group as an actor in community building. It is both medium and, in the most reductionist McLuhanesque sense, message. One of the most prominent messages is memorialization. In addition to a roadside memorial tradition, the bridge is painted when a young person dies. In a reunion of former bridge painters, it crosses school affiliation, particularly when this affiliation has lost its immediate meaning. This happens alongside, and sometimes organized through, the now commonplace Facebook memorial group. Even among digital natives, the desire to express grief and loss on the literal concrete of the bridge is seen as a necessary step in the collective mourning process. Memorial trestle painting is symbolically representative of, the ongo of ongoing grief work, forming part of a complex with the Facebook group and the more formal markers of funeral and cemetery. The bridge differs from roadside memorials in two key ways, however. First, the trestle does not mark the site of the accident or death, marking the territory as dangerous. Its power comes from its communicative role. Secondly, the nature of painting traditions makes it an ephemeral memorial. By practice, a memorial bridge will go unpainted for about a month before a new message will appear. It does not have the same time depth as the seemingly intangible memorial pages of the internet. But students developed a means for making that message more permanent. It begins in May of 2009. Connor Timmins played soccer for both Sydney Academy and then Cape Breton University. He was killed in a road accident on the morning of May 9th, days before his 21st birthday. Within hours, a Facebook page was started as a site for pilgrimage and digital assemblage. The most recent post is from last, uh, last week, but uh, mid-October. By May 18th, the trestle has been painted, had been painted for Connor in the orange and green of Cape Breton University, which was a first as an aesthetic choice. The bridge comprised a simple drawing of a scoring soccer player, Connor's number, and the adage, too blessed to be stressed, his motto taken from his active church life. This motto took flight. Heretofore absent, it was used on the Facebook page that same day. When late June came and, time, and the time arose for the graduating <laughs> class to repaint, there was much discussion over how to be respectful to Connor's memory while maintaining the tradition. It was decided to incorporate the too blessed to be stressed message onto the new bridge, albeit now in the Riverview colors, and to move it from the front of the bridge to the back wall, adding the names of other recent losses. You see those there. Over the course of a number of bridge paints, this wall was spared, even if it conflicted with the rival color scheme. New names would be added when appropriate. One painting by Sydney Academy began a process of recoloring the wall, and soon thereafter, Riverview repainted it entirely. Then Sydney Academy highlighted its losses in blue paint. Almost exactly a year ago, when Rail America painted the bridge, the paint supporters in the larger, i.e. the adult community, lamented the loss of this wall. That this wall had been retained and maintained not through explicit policy, but through communal consensus, was seen as indicative of the positive role this bridge could have as a medium of adolescent expression. On May 12th of this year, 15-year-old Matthew Gerard Fitzgerald and 17-year-old Fergus Tyler McKinnon were killed while out joyriding. The Facebook page created in the aftermath drew RIP trolls, those who deliberately target memorial pages for mocking the deceased and the grieving process. This, in conjunction with scathing comments to articles in the newspaper about the accident, made the internet an unsafe space for grief. Where the car came to rest quickly became a spontaneous shrine, but Ferg had been a painter. His name appears throughout my photo archive. A friend overheard a student say that because they couldn't paint the trestle, they would paint everywhere else. This included the sidewalks outside Sydney Academy, the playground of an elementary school, the back of a local call center, and the walls of convenience stores. The trestle as the consensus location for adolescent messages was demonstrated negatively. In its absence, alternates are found. So many alternates that, in late August, when yet another teen was killed, one of the earliest posts was from a family friend asking that there be no painting. They wished to avoid being surprised by their daughter's name in the landscape. The girl's name went unpainted. 
even when Riverview painted the bridge last month. In a paint largely orchestrated through Twitter, including warnings about the now vigilant police presence, the graduating class of 2013 reestablished a bridge paint, so much so that Sydney Academy came by the next night to paint over top. What this means for the future of memorial bridge painting, however, remains unclear. So that is sort of where I stand with the trestle stuff. Um, I'm not 100% sure where I'm going with it next. It, obviously, I'm going to start writing it up into, into some kind of compiled process. I don't know whether it's uh, whether I yet have enough for a manuscript. If I do, it would be a, a, um, a reasonably s small one. Um, but I'm still investigating that, for, uh, obviously. Um, I need to sort of figure out the, the appropriate plot and structure on how to, how to deal with this and how to introduce the idea of history and traffic in a way that's actually simultaneously readable, which is a bit of a challenge. So the next thing I did, a little bit of housework, was clearing up my dissertation for um, submission uh, uh, and, and for publication into a book called uh, A Vulgar Art, A Folkloristic Approach to Stand-Up Comedy. It's based on my dissertation. It's been submitted to and accepted uh, pending some revisions by the University Press of Mississippi. The press maintains catalogs in both folklore and popular culture. I think I have this on the slide, so maybe I'm just repeating myself. Uh, I was a participant in this year's Folklore Studies in a Multicultural World workshop at the American Folklore Society. That's a, that's a collaboration between three presses, uh, Mississippi, Wisconsin, and Illinois, and the uh, American Folklore Society, and it's funded by the Mellon Foundation. And Dr. Janice Talk, hey, was a member of that workshop last year. So um, I think we're... Thanks for the shout out. Oh, that's what I'm here for. Um, and I believe that is the, um, we might be the sole Canadian representative. So, you know, CBU representing, that's good. Uh, the structure of the book is uh, revised from the thesis in that it's based on the, um, and this is where the significant revision this year took place, it's based on the structure of an evening at a nightclub, at a comedy club. So we have the opener. That's the thing that you can show up late for if you want. It's kind of a, a kind of a literature review, but you can sort of talk your way through it, and, or you know, don't don't pay a huge amount of attention. Um, and you know, it's the theory. Uh, it's a single chapter which begins with a very brief overview of stand-up scholarship, and emphasizes why it is insufficient as its focus is largely on function. I then make the case for folklore by providing background into a number of keywords in folklore, grouped by context, texts, and textures that will be applied to the work. It's not a literature, literature review per se, but the foundation of the folkloristic approach to stand up. And it includes other informing studies of the folklore popular culture continuum. The second part, the middle, that's the guy who maybe you'll hear about later. In many ways, it's actually the more, it could be better than the closer, but it's not necessarily the reason why you showed up at the club to begin with. Um, and that has to do with four chapters speaking to the idea of live performance. Um, the first examines the effects of being on a stage the concrete differentiation of performer from audience, the plainness of the diegetic stagescape, the microphone as both prop and eventually as symbol within stand-up, and amplification, and finally video projection, and how they are both obstacles to and tools for creating intimacy. I move <coughs> on to a chapter on social identity in stand-up co uh, comedy, deals with vernacular understandings of what a stand-up comedian is, what sort of performance a person would expect when they go to a performance labeled stand-up comedy. Um, then an idea of a performance of self, a chapter which looks at the performance, uh, a performance of autobiography or the creation of a character on stage that is meant to be understood as, for the most part, coterminous with a person off stage. And finally, uh, no, uh, finally in this section at least, uh, one about the intimate other, which examines the strategies employed by a comedian to connect their own experiences, in part through their performed autobiographies, to the audience and thus create the zone of intimacy that allows for the casual form of talk that is stand-up to go forward. The third section, the, uh, the headliner, is sort of the, uh, in many ways, it's sort of the sexiest section because it deals with comedy most broadly uh, promulgated, that being uh, broadcast and recording. And uh, one chapter looks at the history of live as live and recorded broadcasts and the effect that they have had on the form and, and audience expectations. And one on, the, um, on recordings. The, which examines the development of recordings and other media that allow for an audience's experiencing and re-experiencing of a performance and the effect that has had on the form, including, of course, the idea of comedians referring to classic recordings in a form of canon and thus, you know, actually um, uh, building upon established patterns and, and learning from it and extract, abstracting from them. So that's that manuscript out of the way. Uh, read some comic books. 
And my next project, one that I am still in the uh, processes of working out, I've yet to do the ethics review for, um, but will uh, have developed is a chapter for an upcoming collection on exp uh, exploring Canadian identity in comics. And it's on the old trout funnies and the CBLA. I'm going to have Chris start this. Um, it was embedded, and then this computer can't handle embedded, so we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned Vanna White way. Um, so this chapter examines Paul Moose McKinnon's Old Trout Funnies, a three-issue comic book and which is complemented by ancillary materials such as full poster calendars, sporadically published in the years since. Originally a final project for his program at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, the comic concerns the activities of an underground, rebel underground rebellion, the Cape Breton Liberation Army. In the first issue, the CBLA, led by superhero General Payton, wave, um, you still here? General Payton left, um, hijacks a beer truck before escaping to Prince Edward Island. In issue two, General Payton and some new recruits join forces to fight giant spruce budworms. Finally, in the multiple stories in issue three, the CBLA returns to Cape Breton from exile, kidnaps a phony OPEC minister, and fights a government force based in Earth orbit, while a prehistoric man, revived from suspended animation, <coughs> saves two CBLA gorillas from a bear. Throughout the issues, McKinnon references local characters, landmarks, and concerns, framed within the context uh, of increasing Quebec nationalism and separatism discourse, and the irony of Cape Breton as a site for the American back to the land movement. Albeit with a manic and absurdist energy for the primary purpose of entertainment, the books give voice to a growing sense of isolationism in mid-1970s Cape Breton, with the decline of the industrial bases of coal and steel becoming an increasing inevitability and bringing with it the beginnings of outmigration. Through interviews with both McKinnon and some of the inspirations for his characters, this chapter will aim at locating the comic within the specific worldview of 1970s urban Cape Bretoners. In addition to the shared identity of locality, the creator, or the creators, if you want to look at it as a collaborative act, and presumed audience appear to coincide with other producers and consumers of underground comics of the era. Characterized as overwhelmingly young, i.e. under 30, white, middle class in origin, urban, non-religious, or following an esoteric sectarian movement, fairly well educated, and possibly attending college. Spiegel averse that uh, history, context, market, and production and distribution system of underground comics suggests their utility as an indicator of the values of a distinct subcultural group. Although her research was into the broader phenomenon of underground comics, I suggest that the, the same inevitably holds true on the micro scale of an individual underground comic title. Finally, this chapter will explore how the comic is received by contemporary Cape Bretoners almost two generations removed from its initial publication through an ethnography of comic reception, and will report on my own efforts to create an annotated critical edition of the title. This includes the potential for new forms of mediation, such as the animatic created here by Chris Jones, which goes on for a couple of minutes, and it's lovely, and we will have it available somewhere. Um, I, I, Chris went above and beyond noodling with this. So, um, yay for his noodles. <laughs> uh, By the, the way, um, the bestest character is Peter McIntyre's first cousin. Get out of here. Yeah. Danny McIntyre. Uncle Ward. Yep. <laughs> 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 uh, watching television. A little bit more watching television. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the articles that I produced was co-written with Jody McDavid of the research office, uh, not necessarily in her capacity as research officer, but why not, and called, it's a chapter called uh, Who's Got the Power, Super Why, Viewer Agency, and Traditional Narrative. This is for a forthcoming book on, um, I think they're calling it Channeling Wonder, Fairy Tales on Television. Super Y is a co-production of the Canadian State Broadcaster, the CBC, and the American PBS Network, and is a significant component in the respective kids, uh, CBC, uh, sorry, kids CBC and PBS Kids programming blocks. The show incorporates a variety of genres. The child is adventurer, common to much recent educational programming, like Dora the Explorer, or the Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that. The superhero team, and most notably for our purposes, traditional folk and public domain narrative. It introduces spelling, literacy, and vocabulary alongside rudimentary answers to social problems as experienced by toddlers, which are mainly about good behavior and observing social mores. Working within a rigid structure, each episode entails the super readers, a team of four child superheroes, each with a lexicographical superpower, lexicographical, that was right, entering the pages of a book to address a problem in the story that parallels a problem one of the heroes is having in their daily life. <coughs> 
excuse me. Alongside the super readers, the viewer encounters a series of layered worlds, a television program opening in a real library, Storybrooke Village, where the protagonists live, reached through a bookshelf in that library, and the particular narrative used as the text for each episode. By breaking the fourth wall, by addressing the viewer directly, by endowing him or her with the name Super You and the power to help, and by asking for assistance in three tasks, the show turns the viewer into an active character within the story. We approach Super Y from two different contexts. Our first encounter with the show was through our son, who had started watching it at age one, alongside the slightly older children with whom he shared a sitter. It became a mainstay in our house, largely due to the excitement he expressed when it came on and his irritation upon each episode's completion. Over time, we developed a grudging respect for the show when we saw how it had a positive influence on his burgeoning alphabet and reading skills. This respect came despite our backgrounds. Neither of us is a particularly conservative folklorist by either training or inclination. We are comfortable with the idea that there is no fixed text, that the motif and tale type indices collectively ought to be read more as a history of the ongoing reimaginings of particular clusters of names, motifs, and plot points, and less as a definitive listing of canonical tropes and that without dynamic retelling, the tradition lies moribund. We hold with Greenhill and Matrix that the movement of traditional fairy tales to cinematic form may have enabled their commodification in capitalist socioeconomic structures, but filmed fairy tales are as much the genuine article as their telling in a bedroom story or an anthology, and that this holds equally true for television. Yet we remain uncomfortable, to use a wishy-washy term, with how Super Y presents traditional narratives. What, fought, what the chapter deals with is, in many ways, our efforts at articulating this discomfort and reconciling our ambiguous feelings towards the show as both parents and as folklorists. Without challenging the effectiveness of the program in developing child viewers' reading skills, we seek to address a series of interrelated questions. These concern the reworking of a traditional text to articulate both a problem that needs solving and its easy solution, the functionalist interpretation of fairy tales as a source for moral and social education, and the privileging of text over orality. We explore these issues within the layered worlds of the program and from the perspectives of its creators. So that has been accepted by the editors and complete. We'll, we'll see what happens with the publishers, but it's uh, been looked at enthusiastically. And um, I do want to thank Jody for doing the lion's share of the actual thinking and me the lion's share of the actual typing and watching television. I, had, I was the one who had to, uh, uh, we remembered the examples and then I was the one who had to track down the episodes and watch them. So I had a pretty nasty week, which I know it's better than digging a ditch, but <laughs> a pretty nasty week, to, week of watching about 15 episodes of these a day. It, just, uh, it was um, trying to say the least. <clears throat> I want to talk more about watching television, and this is the, the, the next major uh, book project that I'm trying in the process of developing, and it's called Based on the Stand-Up Comedy Of. It's not really called that, but that is certainly the, the, the topic. Um, it's an unexplored area for my dissertation, uh, or from a vulgar art, depending on which, one you, which way you want to look at it. Uh, there's no other work that exists on the topic of the genre situation comedies based on the stand-up comedy of. There are relatively few studies on specific examples. Um, Roseanne, Grace Under Fire, typically like many of the, uh, like what I encountered a lot in academic studies of stand-up comedians, there are uh, examples that are given as indicative of particular perspectives. So Cosby in terms of blackness, Roseanne and uh, uh, Grace Under Fire in terms of uh, both class and, and feminism, but not really an overview of the whole, of the whole um, structure. And one of the things that I tried doing both in stand-up and in this work is not necessarily looking at particularly uh, beautiful versions of the form that we can all point to as, as um, exemplary. Uh, you also have to look at indifferent comedians and indifferent sitcoms. So you have to look at things like uh, the Jeff Foxworthy show, and you have to look at um, uh, Mr. D and those sorts of programs, which are eh. I'll go out on a limb and, and describe them officially as eh. Um, um, but they, they deal with the idea of, as I said earlier in the presentation, I was talking about my work, the, the idea that the comedian creates a worldview in which his, his or her text needs to be interpreted, and that is what's going on stage. And that worldview becomes the fodder for creating a narrative, uh, you know, the, the situation from which the comedic, uh, the, the each individual episode's uh, comedic foibles and brouhaha arise. So um, 
it's that it's that uh, implied or created verbal worldview, and then rendered on the literal stage with literal ca with you know casts and so forth. So um, that is the study. But if you've ever if you if your reading materials as a child were limited to TV Guide as mine were, um, you would be amazing how many times the the basic expression "This is what my life would have been like if I hadn't gone into comedy" is in the beginnings of say fall preview issues. Um, I can think of about ten different examples right off the bat, uh, Corner Gas, um, again, Grace Under Fire, again, Roseanne, uh, and so forth. OK, three is different from 10. Um, uh, James Preen can correct me on that. Uh, maybe it isn't. So, and this is currently the object of my, uh, my uh, recently submitted, i.e. Monday, RP grant, and what I'm going to work on for my February Insight Development grant. Um, and then the last thing about watching television is the CFI application that Ruby Ramji and I have put together, Media Interpretation Reception Lab, which is an ethnographic space for the study of media participation. As I said, it's a grant currently under review, prepared in collaboration with Ruby Ramji. It's for the ethnographic study of media viewership and participation. We are each engaged in long-term programs of research pertaining to how media is consumed and interpreted by an audience. For Dr. Ramji, it is images and narratives of ethnic and religious identity as portrayed through popular culture and how they reflect, bolster, challenge, or undermine the self-perception of their ostensible counterparts. For me, it is the ritualistic nature of watching particular television and other media programming, election results, sporting events, concerts, and stand-up comedy, where obviously I had this as... Um, the, the, uh, this insight was born, whose live or as live framing draws the audience into the performance in a manner that transcends the time-space distance between themselves and the performers. In order to conduct these two distinct yet correlative programs of research, specialized space is required. The space will allow for the viewing of a variety of visual homeostatic media in a setting that replicates a natural viewing context. It allows for observing and recording the performative nature of media participation, and it can convert to a space for the recording of interviews with the participants. Um, the MIR lab, it's an ugly an uh, acronym, but what do you do? The MIR lab consists of a mid-sized viewing room with room for 12 oversized seats, easily moved and arranged to accommodate either the viewing of media on the large display or into a circle for group interviews or out of the way entirely for media participation that requires space and movement, like bodily interactive video gaming. Um, this room will be permanently wired with multiple cameras and microphones for capturing both media participation and the follow-up ethnographic interviews. The strengths of the space are both the unobtrusiveness and the turnkey nature of the recording process. The Mir Lab will be equipped with multi-region DVD and Blu-ray players, a multi-region VCR, and a full satellite or digital cable package. It will serve as a monitor for hard drive content and will have an internet connection for streaming media. Furthermore, easily accessible external inputs will be present for peripheral devices as they are needed. The room will have 5.1 surround sound speakers. I can skip some of this. Uh, using flexible and readily available technology will allow the researchers to upgrade over the life of the research space. Two adjoining offices will serve the researchers and student researchers. One will primarily serve as a control room with monitors for the video recording and storage for servers and media. The other will be a more flexible workspace for one-on-one -on -one interviews and less technology-dependent research. What makes the space distinct is not so much the ability to view multiple formats, although it is enhanced by having them so readily accessible, but to do so in a manner that approximates the way which media is consumed, i.e., comfortably. This notion of comfort may at, see, at first seem a strange keyword upon which to pin a research space. However, neither a smart classroom nor a theater parallels most media consumption, which has moved to, moved to the domestic sphere, if, like television, it was ever anything but. This emphasis on comfort is even more important for the interviewing components of research. Far different from a seminar-style room, the room resembles a domestic or tavern-like conversation area. The permanent wiring for recording allows for an absence of tripods, visible microphones, and so forth. Whereas no one will be recorded surreptitiously or without consent, the recording will be unobtrusive. As this is for research purposes and not broadcast, we are striking a balance between comfort and recording fidelity and favoring the former. This infrastructure will enable a broad swathe of research. For Brody, it will allow for the study of media viewership as ritual through a number of media experiences, sports, nationalistic performances, elections, and television events. Would have been a great room to watch last night. Um, which, gives lie to the no which gives lie to the notion of passive media receptivity or um, uh, that. Sorry, because like the notions of passive media receptivity as being incompatible with social interaction. And for Ramji, it will provide new or improved public policies and programs, including improved regulations and codes of practice in relation to immigration and multicultural policies in Canada. And we're also beginning a collaborative project on um, 
nice Venn diagram of our, of our research interests, um, uh, the subgenre of religious comedy. Uh, I've been interested in a while in doing um, uh, research into uh, uh, comedy on, among the Southern Baptist circuit, you know, since, uh, intentionally and inherently clean comedy. Um, I've got a great co growing collection of uh, uh, Mormon and Latter-day Saints comedy. And uh, of course, um, Islam comedy is, is another area where it's both, uh, it speaks to, um, sometimes it is meant to be emanating from uh, that faith perspective, and sometimes it's meant to be emanating within that faith perspective, and those two things need to be uh, addressed simultaneously. And our first project will be um, that nice marriage of, of, of Islamic comedy. So I think our somewhat, our occasionally disparate research agendas blend very well in that project. So, that is sort of, oh yeah, I had that one. There you go. So, that is sort of the presentation as it stands. I need a little bit of a summary. So one of the things that I, I guess I did is I completed or saw the completion of a number of pre-existing projects. Um, as I said, Vulgar Art, that special issue of JGE that uh, Heather mentioned. Uh, I engaged in the lion's share of my current research project in terms of the trestle. I um, have started to develop a new program of research that's away from sort of the folklore of a particular region that I've always been uncomfortable with and sometimes have felt compelled to teach within. And uh, I've decided to just branch out and do something that is not wholly different from it, but, but more informed by my own perspective. Developed other projects like Old Trout Funnies, um, the Mirror Lab based on the stand-up comedy of, and I've built new internet networks for future collaboration, including <coughs> things like a performance studies uh, workshop and, and other forms of uh, travel. So um, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> So yeah. So there's time for questions. Yes. Um, I'm curious to go back uh, back to the first project and your mention of grading day, mm -hmm. and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Um, as a as a parent and an educator, it's always something that's really uh, rank, well bothered, rankled me about, yeah. uh, as a ritual and. Um, I have a yeah, I have some strong feelings about it as a ritual when when I'm out in public and I have people asking, you know, my yeah. my eight year old daughter whether she rated, yeah. uh, it sort of it says to me that this is like that, that the mark of success here is to pass. Mm -hmm. And there's some question about whether and that the mark of stigma is not to pass. Uh, yeah, but but that that's but that that is, you know, that that that, uh, that, that that's the mark of success is yeah. uh, it's problematic. So, but tell me, how do that success you mentioned and that, that, that success is meant to be marked and celebrated in, in a big way? I mean, it's not simply like the graduation, it's simply the moving from one year to another. It is unusual for people who are not from here to see that. I've heard, I mean, I haven't really got into this as a research project per se. I've heard a number of interesting um, sort of origin narratives about it in terms of you don't understand how poor we were and that uh, we needed to sort of provide expectation or um, incentive for people to remain in school, so Grady Day ar arose in that way. And I can see that logic to a certain extent, although I I, I'm about to do the same head shake that you're about to do, although there are many other places that had uh, the same, if not worse, uh, levels of poverty. Uh, you can think of the North Shore of New Brunswick. You can think of all around uh, the outpour communities in Newfoundland. The same levels, perhaps even worse, of want, different from the urban settings that uh, didn't develop these same kind of, of, um, of markers and, and rites of passage. Uh, I don't know enough about it. And I think it's one of those things where the narrative of the origin is as critical to, to try and extrapolate as the origin itself, because it has to do with Again, I think the idea that with the uncertain future, the thing, uh, the, the the present needs to be celebrated in a sort of fairly boisterous way. Yeah, yeah. but then that, that celebration tied to the, the purchase of yeah. trampolines and iPods and whatever, yeah. you know, bicycle yeah. bikes. Yeah. The, like the I would have made it never do one year. Academic yeah. success yeah. is conflated with material. Yeah, I happened to be going to dinner at Gijus or whatever it was called before and it was a grading day and member two and everybody got a bike. And it's like, really? I mean, and as opposed to the traditional Ontario version of grading about 
not getting your ass whooped. That's your present. <laughs> so, but there we go. Um, it's tentative, and I think, uh, uh, you know, if I were to pursue it more, I think the idea of, of talking both insider, uh, to insiders and outsiders about their various perspectives, and I'm presuming that you've had, hey, Dad, what are you getting me for grading day? It's like, uh, what? <laughs> Child? Um, <laughs> no, it just really wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. It was never a ritual that took hold in, in my family. No, but there might have been pressure. I mean, the expectation right. from through your kids from their peers, and um, I remember Tony Secco mentioning that. You know, what are you getting me for grading day? <laughs> so uh, you know how well that turned out. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things that strikes me that's really interesting, and I commented at the beginning about how it is really, it's really fascinating to see around to quite different topics, but one of the things that seems to be coming through with, I think, guess the exception of stand-up comedy, which is interesting, but it has connections too, is that there seems to be a real emphasis to youth culture for you right now, so between the super wide television and the mm -hmm. bridge painting and the, 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 the comics. comics. Um, I'm just wondering, do you see yourself at this point as somebody who is as a folklorist of youth culture? Do you see that as something that you are trying? Like, will there be something as a result of sort of exploring these different youth cultural projects that will lead to a sort of? I think so, to, to a certain extent. I mean, that, that is a framework that goes beneath because, again, it is a, it's a stage of such transition, doubly so as we've extended that transition. I, you know, the Super Y one is, is a bit more of an outlier in terms of it being really children's sure. culture, although. I mean that sort of you know sharpening my um, a sharpening my autoethnographic pencil, and and also um, uh, you know maintaining the the idea of you know a folk literature scholar you know in potency if not in act engaging in that kind of thing, um, but it does to me it's uh, certainly adolescent and late adolescent culture. I extend that all the way up to to university or even in graduate school to a certain extent has been a fairly dominant theme. In the past I've written about things like first bra purchases and, and um, uh, but also legends about comps reading, uh, comp studying things. So it has tended to be the emphasis in part, I don't think, um, uh, in, in part because I think that is a process in which culture starts to emerge at its most, um, I don't want to say vibrant, but it is a period of questioning. It's, it's not a period of settling that sometimes happens in, as one gets to the advanced age of, say, me, so as not to offend anyone else. Um, and, um, and so yeah, I mean, it, it is an ongoing theme, I think, this, uh, this movement of both resistance and incorporation that takes place starting in early adolescence and really not settling until the post, post, post adolescence of of people, I'd say, probably in their 30s or so forth. But uh, yeah, is it is a theme. Is it much in the way of folk literature dealing, folklore literature dealing with, uh, with this age group? I know there's lots on children's folk songs, that's what I would know about. Yeah, but there, um, there's a lot on adolescence, and there's a lot on university as well. There's a new book uh, by Bronner on campus traditions and university folklore. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Tucker is, she's, is an, um, it's framed as a children's folklore scholar, but most of her work is between, is um, girls between say 15 and 25 or so. So again, this transitional stage and this, this uh, socially extended transitional stage. Um, yeah, so, and it also, I mean, it, it's become an interest for practical reasons as well in that, um, I mean, that's how it, it gets embedded into teaching because this is basically the age of the people that are there in my classes. So the, the recognition that these things that we might not necessarily want to call folklore um, are, are actually the same kind of dynamic processes as they're involved in on their day to day. They serve as useful illustrators of that. Um, there's a great, um, great quote by Polly Greenhill, which I'm not going to quote verbatim, but has to do with the idea that once a community starts calling its practices folklore, that is a sign of that practice actually in decline or moribund or being propped up artificially. You know, oh, this is our great folklore. It's like, well, then it you know, basically means your grandma's dying. Um, <laughs> Uh, but as opposed to, oh, this is just some silly stuff that we do. The silly stuff that we do is the dynamic, uh, the dynamic emergent context. So, there. Thanks for that question. I hope so.
Um, big screen, surround sound, extra comfy chairs. Mm -hmm. And the satellite package, you are my hero. Yeah. <laughs> CFI's paint, it's amazing. Um, but well, one you not wood, I'm Jameson. Okay, well, you know, um, whatever wood product this happens to be. Um, but last night, as I was watching the election, part of it was you know, trying to stay up as late as possible to get the last bits of return before you fall asleep. And I talked to several of my friends who were doing the same thing. Uh, they were tuck themselves in bed and watch as much of you know, the results as they could. Um, so are you going to deal with time of day and that sort of thing? Because, you know, sports is on at night and all that. That would be an issue, I think. I mean, I guess it would depend on the individual projects, obviously. I mean, Nova Scotia elections wouldn't have the same thing as a national election with polls closing later and later in the day. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would to, to an extent. Olympics, were happen things happening in the middle of the night would be one. But there's also the idea that we could look at media consumption as that single activity. So all your friends are at home by themselves or perhaps with spouse watching television in bed. But contrast that with the images that were on television of people watching things on television as they happened and the intense dynamics that were in place. And if you have gathered together, you know, in any kind of social occasion to watch these sorts of things, time becomes less of a factor, um, obviously. So, I mean, um, and, and, and time of day at least becomes less of a factor because you have framed it as an event and you are allowing yourself that license of staying up late and imbibing while doing so and eating nachos at the same time. All these sort of things that turn it into, um, you know, lowercase f festival in a way. It becomes a time out of time, certainly special event activities that way. Um, on the practical level, yes, I imagine that you know, doing the research here would be different from doing it in Vancouver where everything is so very early and they can still go to bed at a decent hour. But yeah, Terry? I'm so curious, the um, trust of agents, the students that participate in the activities that you start, how do they see themselves, like when they're talking to you as a the object of research, mm -hmm. like how do they see themselves as objects of research or what does it mean for that? I think, like most, like most people who are studied by folklorists, and which is one of the reasons why research ethics boards are such bastards, is that they <laughs> recognize or they want to be recognized, just as importantly, as bearers of tradition. That this is not something that they are doing anonymously or it's not something that they necessarily feel shame about. It is something that they not only want to participate in, but they want to be identified as participating in. The research ethics board has to do with the idea of, well, how do you, you're rendering data anonymous and providing people with pseudonyms. And that's just a constant theme. You probably experience this in ethnomusicology circles and folklore. It's always the, I can't name my informants or give them identifying characteristics, which just really undermines the very nature of the project. So most of the part, most of the time, they, they understand themselves as, as uh, proud, active agents in this and in, in, uh, invested. In it and therefore wish to communicate. Um, and sometimes it's not. It's an unusual thing to be interested in, though, the, the trestle per se. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind um, of a. Well, it's unusual because it is not something, I mean, it's not something that's of our folk group. It's something that the teenagers do, and that's it. And so again, it's that, it's that foolishness that goes over, and why would you take it seriously? And the thing, I think one of the things I'm trying to formulate is that. Um, sort of have a general theory that for the most part people are sort of fundamentally lazy and they wouldn't participate in something unless they either felt compelled to or impelled to and either they're forced to do it or they're doing it because it's something that they consider worth doing and so just the fact that it actually occurs is something that is that alone is worth investigating why do people do this however one's own personal opinions on, on the phenomenon this is something that people do why are they doing it what is being communicated by doing it what do they think that they are expressing while doing so? Um, then bring in the arguments of, of uh, the, the conflict that arises and, and uh, other people. But one of the th things that, and this has to do with sort of the general tenets of children's folklore in, in general, which can be extended to adolescent folklore, is that we tend to think that we understand children's culture because we were once children, when really we have developed from that and our and children's culture and that extends to adolescent culture is fundamentally different with different sets of expectations, different notions of peer, different ways that time is measured. One of the really interesting things I think is the notion of generation that happens and I think I talked about this in the fresh, in the, in the fresh presentation but that 
think about it at a university, we tend to f frame our time at the university in terms of when we were hired, when particular people were hired, when our sabbaticals take place. So we think of things in much broader terms, while students think of things in terms of year or perhaps program. So their, their understanding of a generation is three years or four years, while our understanding of a generation might be you know, between when one person got hired and one person finally retired. You know, 20 or 30 years, potentially. So we, we just um, inhabit the same space in two completely separate times. Um, and that's something that needs to be addressed and considered. So people say, well, so when you have students say, well, this has always happened. Um, it's happened for, the painting the bridge has happened for 31 generations, if you want to put it that way. So it's equivalent to people singing, you know, Ring Around the Rosy. It's longer in terms of, if you measure it by generations, than a tradition like that. Which is a, a absurd comparison, but you know, valid at the same time. It's happened for, and certainly it's happened literally, but before many of these people were actually born. Uh, where for other people, it's something that happened and you know, started, I don't know, mid-70s, and it's just something that stupid kids did. And, but you know, because they're measuring time in a completely different way, and they forget that time is measured in a different way. That's my answer. Any last question? Don't be afraid. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much for coming out. Really appreciate it.